Thank you. Um, so I consider myself a craftsperson. Um, I use the human body as um, my interface, and I use novel and emerging technologies as my medium. And when people see my work, um, the question I get a lot is, why in the hell would you come up with something like that? And um, I think this, this really goes back, I think, um, into just where I'm from. So I was born and raised in Taiwan. Um, it's a small island country off the coast um, of mainland China. And what's very special about it and what has informed um, the work that I do is um, it has a very vibrant street culture and you can very easily change the way you look and express yourself through these very cheap cosmetic extensions. And um, I was also raised by women um, and grew up watching the women around me um, work on what we would today call, traditionally call woman's craft. And I think this just gave me a, a different perspective towards what I felt wearables um, today and in the future could look like. Um, today I will use three different themes um, that have informed my work to share three projects um, with you. And the first one is separation. So I am also an immigrant, so I moved to Boston um, four years ago to pursue a degree in wearable computing. And I wanted to find something that could make me feel more connected um, to my homeland. I really miss these beautiful nail art salons, um, very accessible in Taiwan, but harder to find in Boston. And this inspired me to create um, this work called Nailo, um, which we explore using the fingernail as a input surface to control your devices. And you can also customize how the device looks so it can really be an extension of your personal identity and your personal style. And technically, you can look at it as a capacitive touch trackpad that is miniaturized to the size of your fingernail. And you can pair it um, with anything with the wireless module to control it. In this example, we're showing um, interaction with the mobile phone. And I think um, just working in wearables, we often think about, you know, this kind of cyborg future we're heading, where this boundary between technology and ourselves, it, it's like becoming more and more nuanced and blurred. But there is a lot of um, phobia towards kind of this future we're heading because we kind of feel like, do we still have control over our own bodies or is technology taking control? And also in thinking about um, these questions um, in my research, um, I find these cosmetic extensions that I grew up around to be a really interesting middle ground because first of all, um, they're, they become very seamless, totally integrated into our bodies when they're worn, but they're also very easily removable and customizable. And so I, we started this project um, to first look at um, an artificial fingernail, also as a wearable device. And we were trying to meet a couple of design considerations in creating something like this. And so first of all, um, I wanted it to be very unobtrusive so it could blend into the body, which meant it had to be miniaturized um, to the size of a fingernail. And second of all, second all to afford very natural interactions, um, nothing that you would take a lot of cognitive um, Mental, um, mental power to learn, but it would just come very naturally. And also for it to be appealing to wear, so it has to be aesthetic and stylish. And we also just found like the fingernail to be a really interesting body location because it is a hard surface, so you can easily add, let's say, electronics on it. Um, and our hands are also so dex dexterous. There's so many things that we do with our hands. And... Um, and I really love to talk about prototyping, and as with um, a lot of the creatives also in this audience, um, prototyping really um, you know, takes us from an idea to realization. And so you can see here, this is the first prototype. Um, it looks more like a wristband than a fingernail. Um, you can see that um, it's still wire. We printed these um, electrodes on um, these sheets of um, paper and connected them to a circuit board that we designed ourselves. But you can see, although it is bulky at this point, you can see the first proof of concept that it is a device which you can use as um, input. Um, and so after we did that, we moved on to the second prototype. 
And in the second prototype, um, we put in a lot of effort to miniaturize the hardware board so it would move from this big um, like wristband-like thing into a fingernail. And so this is how the device looked. Um, you can also add, because it is capacitive touch, so you can add additional layers of decoration on top. It would not influence the performance of the device. And here is an explosion diagram of just this um, uh, fingernail sensor look. So we have a top layer, the nail art layer. The second layer are the sensors, or we could call them the electrodes. The third layer is the circuit board, and we have a very um, miniaturized battery, about half the size of a fingernail in the bottom that powers the device. And um, here's the circuit board diagram. I will not bore you to sleep by going into details, but feel free to reference our paper online. Um, and in the third prototype, because now we had the form factor so miniaturized, but it was not conformable to the human body, right? The human body um, has a lot of curves, right? And so um, what we did was we traveled to Shenzhen um, in China, um, which I would call the manufacturing kingdom, um, to, to prototype um, Nalo with, a f with, with flexible circuitry. So you can see this is um, the output um, of our third prototype using a flexible circuit. And what the magical thing with the flexible circuit is and it can allow multiple layers of electrodes on the same surface. So this enabled us to create a diamond layer interlocking electrode, which is also actually um, how our smartphones, our smartphone touchscreens are designed this day. And this enabled us to um, create a lot more gestures and more fine-grained interactions. And so although, like, you know, like, when, when Nalo went out in 2015, most of the attention we got on was a very miniaturized form factor. But I have to say there was a significant amount of um, um, software work that went into this, um, a lot of software algorithms to fil read and filter out um, this very messy and complicated um, capacitive touch sensing data to process it out so it can detect gestures. And so the gestures that are supported by Nalo, um, currently right now there's like left, right, swipe, top down, and also press, so five gestures in total. And so it's important for us to uh, do user studies. So we would bring in participants to our lab and then have them try on the device, see how they feel, ask them what would you do with it. And then we found that people also um, wanted to have the device on other fingers, not just only the thumb, on their pinky. And also very interestingly to have it on multiple fingers so they could like, you know, scroll through all of their, um, like from your index to your pinky to go through a web page or, you know, like to assign a phone number to each number. Uh, to, to assign a phone number to each finger, and maybe you can assign um, somebody you don't like to the middle finger, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so that was very interesting. And what was also important um, is to understand, like, actually the performance, like, how well did our software algorithm work? And it was able to achieve 92% accuracy. And so what would you do with something like this, right? And so I think, first of all, it can kind of act like a third hand um, to help you complete a task when both of your hands are full. So in this example, when you're busy soldering with both of your hands, but you're trying to navigate um, the data sheet, um, you can very easily use Nalo as a um, third hand to help you do so. And I wanted to create an example that uh, my grandmother could relate to. Um, she doesn't know how to solder, but she does cook a lot. Um, so also in this example, when you're cooking and trying to like, you know, go through um, the cookbook on your tablet, um, you can also use Nail as a third hand to help you complete a task. And this also goes for scenarios when we're running in motion, we're at the gym, where we're trying to like, you know, interact with our devices. And also because of its very um, small and miniaturized form factor, um, it can also enable a lot of like, very private and subtle input. So for example, today I'm in a meeting, a very important meeting, and, but I suddenly get this um, really important text message um, of a family emergency. So I don't want to disrupt the meeting, but I have to answer this, test, this text. So I can very easily do that um, by swiping nail under the table. And also just in thinking about, um, you know, the future of wearables, I really think in the future, um, since, like, just electronic devices are getting so miniaturized, um, they can be more integrated in our garments, our accessories, and also for it to become a device with which to control and change how we present ourselves in different social scenarios. And so next, I would like to share the theme around identity. And I really love this um, the saying by Cynthia Wilson. She's a culture critic, um, where she really um, 
underscores um, how you know our style, what the things we wear, um, really projects who we are to the rest of the world, to the world around us. And um, I also became really fascinated um, just by the amount of body art, um, the way the fascinations that we as humans we innately have to decorate and alter how, how our bodies look um, throughout time um, and also across different cultures. And this led to um, this project called Dual Skin. Um, it's basically a fabrication process to enable anyone to create um, a on-skin interface on their body. And I also get a lot of questions about how I came up with this idea. Um, there's, of course, like very scientific reasons why this is the next step for wearables. But actually, it came when I was reading Vogue. Um, I read Vogue all the time. Um, I tell my advisor it's like you know part of my research. <laughs> um, so I came across this article around these um, these these temporary tattoos, and but they were gold or silver. They call them like metallic temporary tattoos. And even Beyonce had her own line, which made them like totally legit. Um, and so, <laughs> yeah, and so, and so I saw these, and as an engineer, um, this is really nerdy, but as in, because they look gold or silver, I was like, are they conductive? conductive? So I bought some from Sephora, and I tested them with a multimeter, but they were not conductive, so then out came my new, my new project to make them conductive. That was my mission. And so um, as the hello world of physical prototyping is to light up an LED, this was like one of the first instances I made with dual skin. Um, it's, it's like an LED necklace. Um, yeah, and so going into more detail about um, dual, the, dual, the fabrication process and like how it works and all that. And so dual skin is enabled by a material that I call gold metal leaf. Um, you can buy this um, in a craft store like at Michael's or, um, yeah, I don't know, like, you know, craft stores for, for 15, like, for, for, like, 10 to 15 U.S. dollars for a pack. And um, so it's very cheap. And so we were trying to find a material that was conductive. It has to be aesthetic, you know. It had to look like jewelry. It had to be something Beyonce wanted to wear, right? That's important. And also for it to be skin-friendly. And so the, the composition of this material is mostly copper. We also wear a lot of copper jewelry. And it's also very cheap and accessible, like I mentioned. And so we use this material as the major material to help us um, create this fabrication process. And um, so each dual synth device is basically encapsulated by um, two layers of very thin tattoo paper, which you can also buy at a craft store for 10 US dollars. Um, and it's basically a very simple kind of hand layering process um, to make these conductive circuitry and then to incorporate the electronics. And so I'll go through um, kind of the step-by-step -step process. Um, so the first step is to kind of sketch out um, this, um, this dual skin device that you're trying to make to sketch out the circuitry. Here, I'm showing the example of a, a near-fill communication, an NFC tag. So we have the circuit design over here. And next step is um, we send the design to this very cheap electronic cutter. So this is a Siller Cameo cutter. You can buy it on Amazon for 150 US dollars. Um, and when I looked online, um, a lot of housewives actually use the same machine to make like holiday greeting cards. But now we're just re repurposing it to make like you know interfaces on your skin. But to send it to this um, this cutter, and then so it will then you know it's kind of like a plotter, a very small, a simple plotter, and then it will cut out um, this. Um, circuit design on a sacrificial film layer on top of a tattoo paper. And then, so we then, like, you know, remove, like, the positives um, to create a, a stencil of the circuitry that we want. And with the next step, we then put on, um, we apply, um, like, the gold leaf, the conductive material. And then we remove the negative, and then the last step is to mount the corresponding electronics. And there we have it. So there we have a dual skin device. And so you can um, then, it basically goes on your skin like the way you would wear um, a temporary tattoo, just with water transfer. And yay, you have a dual skin. Yeah. And so that, that's, the base, that's the basic fabrication process. And then so next, I would like to show um, like three examples of things you could do with this fabrication process. Um, so as you can see here, um, they include input, so using your, your body as a controller, um, output using your body as a display, and communication devices. And so first going into input devices, we're using capacitive touch sensing. Um, again, I will not like put everyone to sleep. 
Monday morning with the technical details, but it's, it's basically, um, it can register a signal when you touch it, um, when you touch the electrode. And that is how it detects that a gesture is happening on your body. And um, we designed a lot of different electrode designs. Um, so there's like buttons, there's sliders, and then there's the 2D trackpads, interlocking layers, which is more intricate, but would enable you to do um, like, you know, text input, um, more, more graphical stuff. And so as you can see here is an example of a capacitive touch slider um, working in action. Um, so you can like, you know, use it to turn up the volume of your phone. Basically, you can also pair it with anything with the wireless module, um, such as to turn up the lights in this room, open your car door, et cetera. And this is the example of the two-dimensional interlocking trackpad. So with this, um, with additional software um, algorithms, it can do text input, detect, um, you can like write a text message on your skin. So more um, intricate and um, um, complex um, types of input. And the second class is um, output, um, output displays. And so I think we've all seen like, you know, people wearing a lot of LEDs in their T-shirts and stuff like that. And to be honest, I really hate it. Like, I would never wear something like that. Sorry. <laughs> it's like, it's just, it just looks really geeky. And um, so I wanted to create a display that would look like body art that would not look like something nerdy, but it would look beautiful, it would look like body art, it would look like something that we have been wearing, humans have been wearing like since the beginning of time, right? And so we came, we came across this very interesting material called thermochromics. Um, it's basically a material that would change color when exposed to heat. So you can see here an example um, on, the, um, on the right. Um, so when it's not heated, it's blue but when it is heated through this, um, this serpentine, this kind of circuit like, uh, this, this squiggly circuitry um, made with gold metal leaf, when, it, when the temperature increases, then it turns to a different color, it turns to purple. And so it is a very gradual color change. It is slower, um, but um, from our user studies, um, people found that it was more textured and more layered. And so, um, we also did a lot of explorations with this uh, material um, coupling with dual skin. So you can see that here, this is a rose. Um, and so we separated into three different shells, cells to, to show that you can also program it, right? You can control a different cell to activate or deactivate, um, just like the way you can like, individually control a LED array. And so this is kind of the device working in action. It takes longer for it to um, penetrate the color change, but you can see it has this kind of interesting, um, more magical feel to it than a on-off um, LED. Yeah, and this is another cute example <laughs> that we did. Um, so this is basically like something to sh a fire. Um, it would, it can, it will change color to show you're angry, maybe to your spouse um, <laughs> to warn them beforehand. Um, might be useful. <laughs> yeah. Um, so also like, so like, you know, displaying your emotions, um, showcasing more intimate information to the world. I think these are some potential applications, but of course there's more. And um, the, the third set of device, last but not least, um, is wireless communication, so NFC. So you can see here that in the middle, this is the induction coil that all these, um, these um, NFC tags have. And then we, use, we found a chip that's slightly bigger so people can also work with it with their hands. Yeah, and you can also customize it into different shapes. Um, you can pick like, you know, you prefer circular or stuff like that. Um, yeah, to, so customization is something we think about a lot. And this is just it in action. So we created this like kind of cute app, which you, it's kind of like Facebook on your skin. You can store different images and then um, text it to people. People can read your skin status on your skin, yeah. Um, okay, so creating these devices, we also, it's important for us to do evaluation. And so we often get asked, like, how well does it work? And so we did this, we created this little robot that would stretch the dual skin traces by 10%. And um, we found that it was able to sustain, um, to still be functional after more than 2,000 stretches. And also to um, find people to create, to make dual skins themselves, because um, we don't want this to be like, you know, a fabrication process that only stays within the lab. 
we feel it's important um, for these kind of like seemingly scary um, like cyber technologies to be democratized so people have access to them. So we on purposely made it very cheap and accessible. So we also brought in participants to create their own capacitive touch music controllers. And so you can see someone um, playing, um, like you know, interacting with their device here. And also, um, it was very interesting. Like, so they were given a fixed task of making a capacitive touch music control. But you can see in the um, in the photo on the bottom right how people customized it um, to go with their different styles. So, for example, um, the person in the second image um, preferred like a more tomboyish style. So she made this kind of sh like shell-like um, design. And the person on the far um, right wanted a more bohemian style to go with how she dressed. So I think it's why we think like crafting and um, customizability of our process is very important to enable that. And also to talk about like um, the importance of really bringing these technologies out of the lab. So we did a small scale deployment of dual skin for New York Fashion Week for a menswear fashion line um, where they, so we customized and created these NFC tags and the models um, were, could read data off of these tags, which would show how their garments were designed, um, how they were manufactured, et cetera. And it was a really fun and interesting event for us. And so going um, into um, the third theme um, on displacement. So I think like um, when we're in a foreign country, you often feel like displaced we feel like the feeling is stronger during um, important like cultural holidays. So um, during one Chinese New Year, um, I remember I remember like um, like you know I know I knew my family was having their like family gathering back in Taiwan, but I was here like Boston was having a blizzard um, just because you know Boston like the weather sucks. And so that night went, that night when I went to sleep, I had this dream um, of so this is a traditional. Um, Taiwanese textile pattern. So I had a dream of um, these, the flowers on these textiles, they started to move and just crawl all over my body as if to like kind of say hi to me <laughs> on behalf of my family. Um, so it was a really bizarre dream, but it kind of inspired me to um, create this, to start off with this kind of fun um, art project I did. So it's, um, it's, a, it's, it's a robotic floral textile. So these little flowers, they would move on this piece of fabric. Um, so you can see it kind of moving, like moving. It would go in and out like tidal waves um, here. Yeah, and so this started out as like a, you know, like a cutesy, fun art project. Um, people thought it was really weird <laughs> seeing these little flowers like crawl over all over the place, but um, like we took it a step further and made it even more weird by having it like crawl all over your body. Um, <laughs> so this is um, a project that I call Kino. Um, we're exploring, you know, um, how these kinetic robots, kinetic miniature robots, and having them move on the body to reconfigure themselves to um, serve different purposes. And so this is um, the uh, magnetic drive, just to show the, the mechanism of how these little robots work. So. It's a motor drive, um, so when, when, it, when it goes up, it is able to attach itself to fabric. And um, yeah, so this is one of the mechanical details. We have this really small motor that would um, propel the wheels to go up, and then um, you know the, the magnets, they would keep it stuck together to move up and defy gravity. And again, we have um, like technical details on the circuit board. I, again, will not put everyone to sleep with this, um, but feel free to also reference our paper. And, but like, you know, on a higher level, more importantly, um, we are trying to ask um, this question about like, you know, so, so, okay, so today we made these little robots that can crawl all over your body, but what does it mean to wear something like this? And, would somebody really want to wear this, um, right? So it's important, I think, for we can create all these novel devices, but to really also offer um, just possibilities of where they might go in the future. And so this is like a video showcasing a lot of interactions we created to explore that.
so we actually found people to wear it. They were slightly creeped out, but yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and so I think today in sharing um, kind of, you know, like these three themes that inspire my work, although it's, although it's like personal, but I think, um, I think everyone has their own stories of separation, identity, and displacement. So I think it is something that's actually universal. And I think actually these three themes, they can be boiled down to um, like two main things that I often see missing in um, today's wearable technology, and one is culture and a second is self-expression. And so I really hope that like, you know, through this talk and by sharing my work to really invite everyone to really think about um, how we can, because, because, you know, wearables are something we wear on our body and anything that goes on our body is an expression of our identity, which encompasses where we came from, our culture, and how we would like to express ourselves. And so how do we create wearables that are more malleable um, so they can enable this? Um, and so, um, and so the approach I take is through craft by kind of shifting wearables um, from a device to a material. Um, so as with dual skin, with all of these, it's something that you know, the, the person can create and customize with um, to create something that they can reflect and um, more interact with. So I think craft is an important theme also for my work. And I was really inspired when I came across um, this video. So it's, it's about um, these tin embroidery crafters um, in southern China. So this is like a, long, this is like a craft that, a, a historical cultural craft, and they've passed on this craft throughout generations. And um, even till this day, they're still um, passing it on. They're still striving to pass it on to the next generation. And you see this, these women, and they only make one outfit a day because just amount, the amount of care um, it takes into doing that. So I was really intrigued when I saw this because um, they look a lot like circuits. And so I really think, um, you know, in a way that like old is new and how we can really tie a lot of our cultural and historical histories um, into these, the newest and emerging wearable technologies that we have today. And this is why, like, um, in my work, so this is me making dual skin, you can also see that it's actually a highly craft-involved process. Um, I, want the wear, I want the person who will wear this device to put their heart in it and to really create something that they can relate to. And so it is, um, it is, a, it is an electronic device, but it is also a craft. And another reason that I feel why this is important, because one problem we see with wearables today is um, there's this um, initial excitement when all of these devices first come out, but then it's like, you know, it goes downhill immediately because people, people do not wear it for extended amounts of times because it, in a way, does not evolve with them. And so um, how can we deal with this um, problem as you know, as creatives um, working, you know, in the intersections of technology in this room, we all know that, you know, the technology of today, it soon becomes obsolete tomorrow. That's just the way it is, something we have to live with. But um, I think by incorporating elements of craft into technology, it can become something that has a longer lifetime because it is passed on across generations. It is shared um, to the people around you and people, they put um, their own identity and cultural history into it and making it more rich. And this is why like, I call um, all of my work um, hybrid body craft. And so I use hybrid materials, um, technical and also traditional. And I think of them as materials with which to craft a body. Um, I would like to acknowledge um, my collaborators across um, MIT Media Lab, Microsoft Research, um, Stanford University, and Royal College of Art for all of these three projects. And thank you so much.